Welcome guys to my channel. Today what I'm talking about is some of the weirdest teams to play in USL, uh, which is now branded as the USL Championship. So for the first team that I have is Antigua Barracuda FC. They played in a cricket stadium, which I could imagine would be a pretty bad atmosphere. You know, in Australia, a lot of the teams play in Australian rules football stadiums, which as a result, I've heard that it doesn't help the atmosphere that much. And since the field's so huge, it doesn't help the atmosphere. Uh, and cricket stadiums have pretty big fields, so I have a feeling it would have a certain type of uh, similarity to playing in an Australian rules football stadium to play soccer in it. Uh, the stadium is now called Coolidge Cricket Ground. At the time they played at it, it was called Stanford Cricket Ground, um, but it is called by fans often as Sticky Wicket Stadium, which is cricket reference. It kind of has this weird relationship with Montreal Impact as there was this odd point in time where they basically, when Montreal Impact was a USL team, uh, Antigua, uh, they ended up making two friendlies with Montreal Impact. So, they played the game in Antigua, because there's one in Antigua and one in Montreal. Before the game, like a month or so before uh, the game in Montreal, then Antigua pulled out of the friendly there because they didn't have enough finances, which Joey Saputo, the owner at the time, uh, and Still the owner now was pretty annoyed about that and said about how they lack professionalism. So here's the big thing with them. So, under the newly rebranded USL, which is the league that I'm talking about, I'm not talking about the USL previous. So under the newly rebranded USL, they had this kind of experiment where they thought that they could help out Puerto Rican soccer and just Caribbean soccer in general. So they made this league called the International Division. And what it consisted of was three Puerto Rican teams, Antigua, Barracuda FC, and weirdly enough, Los Angeles Blues. Because Los Angeles didn't really have many teams around it, so they just figured they would throw them in the international division. And then they would move them into a Western conference later on once they proceeded to put more Western teams there. So I imagine that it was a bit of a loss for them. As a bit of a side note, that Los Angeles Blues, I believe, ended up being rebranded eventually down the road to Orange County Soccer Club, which is still in USL Championship to this day. So there was five teams in the international division. There's also a division called the National Division and the American Division, all in USL. Now, the way they were making this international division work was that all the teams would play against each other in an international division four times, which made up for uh, 16 games. And then uh, the season was 24 games long, so the remaining games would be against teams in the national and the American division. And uh, this is a bit of a spoiler alert to the Puerto Rican teams, but you know, I'll address in greater depth at the end because I'm going to have the Puerto Rican teams last in this video. But basically those Puerto Rican teams pulled out, which keep watching the video to find out why, but they ended up pulling out on May 10th, midway through the season in 2011. So that basically that whole international division was scrapped. LA was moved in to one of the divisions. Antigua was moved in to one of those divisions and they just had no more international league and they just continued playing USL despite the huge disruption of three teams leaving midway through the season. Uh, Antigua didn't really have the greatest time uh, after that. Uh, they ended up having a winless season in 2013. I just noticed while editing that Antigua Barracuda didn't just have a winless season, they also broke records by losing all 26 games of their season. That is absolutely crazy and absolutely a horrendous season for Antigua Barracuda. And you can tell that they're not the greatest team as they ended up, uh, well, they had a winless season, but they also played FC Dallas in a packed stadium. I'm telling you, it was a packed stadium. They played their reserves and uh, lost three nothing. So the next team, is Ottawa Fury. The main aspect about Ottawa Fury doesn't have to do with uh, years previous, it's really just the past year. Basically, Toronto FC2 was moving down to the newly formed USL League One for the 2019 season. That left Ottawa Fury as the only Canadian team in USL. 
There was the Canadian Premier League being created in 2019, so you would think that they would be moving to that league, as it's roughly around the same level of quality as USL. Of course, we've got to see that because I haven't seen a USL team play a CanPL team yet. But uh, Ottawa Fury didn't move there. And then they had this whole altercation with CONCACAF where CONCACAF wanted them to move into the Canadian Premier League and they refused and eventually they ended up uh, being allowed to play one more season in USL but I don't know if they'll be staying there. I have a feeling that they'll want to stay there for another year uh, but you know I have a feeling CONCACAF's gonna try and make them move to the Canadian Premier League because it's kind of weird as now there's professional teams in MLS. USL Championship, USL League One, and then USL League Two has some Canadian teams, but that's semi-pro, so I'm not counting that, and the Canadian Premier League, which makes it quite odd for Canadian soccer. By the way, I made a video on this whole altercation with CONCACAF, uh, like around six months ago. For the third team, it's VSI Tampa Bay FC. VSI Tampa Bay FC, it's already hard to say. They had a weird start in the first place because their original name was VSI Tampa Flames and before they even started, they rebranded and called themselves VSI Tampa Bay FC. They also had teams named the same. Uh, they had a team in the W League, which is the women's league, and they had a team in the PDL uh, that was also named the same. So it was kind of weird, there was three teams named the same there. But anyway, an English soccer development academy, Vision Sports Institute, founded the team along with West Florida Flames, who helped to create the team as well. That's a local youth soccer organization in Florida. Though the kind of weird aspect of them calling themselves Tampa, uh, like VSI Tampa Bay FC, is that they ended up playing in a city called Plant City, Florida which only has about a population of 40,000 people and the stadium of 6,700 6, people, I believe, which means that that's over an eighth of their population. But I think the reason why they were playing in a fairly big stadium is uh, they were expecting some people to come from Tampa, even though it's about half an hour away, according to Google Maps from Tampa. They were expecting some people to come to the games uh, for this team from Tampa. But the reality is, is that Tampa Bay already had an established team, and that was Tampa Bay Rowdies. And they were playing in the competing league to USL, which was uh, the North American Soccer League. So everyone was going to those games. They weren't going to VSI Tampa Bay FC. They're already a hard team to say, and it seemed like they lacked a bit of identity. But this team ended up bringing down the whole organization. They only got 450 people per game. So they struggled to gain fans in a fairly isolated area. So this team, it seemed to be taking down the other teams, the Women's League and the PDL team, as those were performing from what I've heard decently given their expectations, but this team way underperformed. So then Vision Sports just ended all three teams at the end of 2013. The team was also playing pretty well in their first season, but for some reason their head coach left. I'm not quite sure why he left. I tried to look it up, I couldn't find out. But he left the team and then they didn't play quite as well after that. So this is a bit more of a general thing. Actually, these are specifying to three teams and soon will be only two. But it's MLS own teams that try and create their own identity, but then yet play in their own parent team, like their MLS team stadium. So to clarify that, I'm not talking about like teams that will be like Toronto FC 2 or Orlando B or Seattle Sounders 2 or Portland 2. I'm talking about teams like uh, Swope Park Rangers. They are an affiliate of uh, Sporting Kansas City. They are owned by Sporting Kansas City, but then they play in Children's Mercy Park. So you would think if they call themselves Swope Park Rangers, that's kind of a hard name to say anyway, just like VSI Tampa Bay FC. You would think that if they name them a different way, they would try and give them a bit of a different identity and giving them, uh, you know, a nice small stadium that maybe could hold like 2,000 people. But nope, they're playing them in Sporting Kansas City Stadium and there's pretty much like 400 people I think coming to the games currently this season on average, which is pretty bad to look on TV. There's currently also Bethlehem Steel, Philadelphia Union's affiliate. There's Ludon United FC 
which is DC United's newly created affiliate. They just started this season. And Swole Park Rangers, as I said, who all are playing in their parent team stadiums, but then uh, they've got this whole separate identity to their team. So there is a bit of an exception with Ludon United FC as they're building a $15 million stadium in Ludon County. So soon they won't be part of that list. Okay, so now the fourth group of teams in this case is Puerto Rico United, River Plate Puerto Rico, and Sevilla Puerto Rico. So USL Pro, as I said, they had this interesting experiment with the International League, which I just explained, where they had Antigua, they had the three Puerto Rican teams, and then they had Los Angeles, which is kind of weird how they have a team way uh, a ways away from the Caribbean uh, that is in the international division. Basically, from what I've heard, from what I was reading, the Puerto Rican league seemed to not be doing too well financially and it seemed like they were having certain competitions, really small competitions in between, but they weren't having the full league running, uh, but it just seemed like they weren't doing that well, they weren't performing that well, and as a result, uh, they weren't able to have the full seasons play out during a two-year period which included 2011 so usl thought hey this is an advantage to work with this puerto rican soccer league and they ended up getting three puerto rican teams into the league and it didn't work out well because they didn't even last a season in usl on may 10th 2011 they pulled out uh, as quoted by usl Due to severe economic difficulties and serious unforeseen medical situations involving the owners from two of the three uh, Puerto Rican Soccer League teams. Again, they're playing in the Puerto Rican Soccer League, uh, but you know they're they're not like spending a crazy amount of money traveling to the occasional game to the U.S. Uh, so that's probably good for them financially. Once again, while editing this video, I noticed something about the Puerto Rican Soccer League. Uh, actually, it seems like they've been on a bit of a hiatus, only having a few small tournaments that doesn't include these three teams. So that doesn't uh, look good for the future of Puerto Rican soccer. And uh, I haven't seen these teams actually play in the last few years, so that doesn't look good for them. So that wasn't a good experiment. Barely lasted, it lasted a couple of months and then it ended up failing ultimately. But anyway, that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please like and subscribe if you did. We're trying to make some content on MLS, USL, the Canadian Premier League, these kind of soccer history videos, these analysis videos that I like to do. But thank you for watching this video, and until next time, see ya.